standing, stay standing, stay standing. I know. We're, we're, it's taken a while to retrain you for this series because we're so used to just sitting down. But if you remember, for the sake of this selfless series, uh, at the very beginning of the teaching time, we're uh, reading through our kind of our foundational passage together. So read with me, if you would, from Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy... Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others." Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. All right, you may be seated. Thank you for doing that. Good morning, Expedition Church. Man, you guys, when we're singing, sounded awesome today. So, so good. Uh, yeah, you're clapping for yourself. Yes, we did. We did sound good. Yeah. <laughs> It's, uh, it's great to have you here this morning. I don't know if you heard Dave say it at the very beginning. Sorry for the chill. Uh, our furnace broke this past week, and so we're... Uh, our warmth is, this morning, our love. Yeah, that's why it's so frigid in here. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, on a side note, if you have $25,000 and you feel like God is leading you to buy us a new HVAC system, let me know. Okay. <laughs> Kevin this morning said, hey, do you need some money to pay the heating bill? And I said, no, we need money to buy a furnace. And so... He didn't offer. <laughs> all right. You're considering. Okay, that's all I can ask for. Yeah, talk to your wife. You better. <clears throat> so here's, here's the, the, the big idea of this series that we're going through, selfless. We believe that if we look at the life of Jesus and we are inspired by his example, then you and I are going to relate to one another in a very unique way. Specifically, if we look at the example of Jesus and if the very love of Jesus flows through us, then unlike relationships characterized often in the world by things like divisiveness and harm and hurt, our relationship, if we're inspired by the example of Christ and if his attitude and his mind is flowing through us, our relationships are going to be uniquely different. Specifically, they're going to be relationships characterized by health and by strength and by love and by unity. And so what we're doing is we are trying to somehow capture this mind of Christ from Philippians chapter 2. And this morning, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to find that there is something unique about Jesus that actually enabled him to go through life and live a selfless life. And if we can understand and capture what that is for ourselves, then you and I will be more inclined to live the selfless life that he lived. And so the goal, and we said it from the very beginning of the series, the goal is that by the time we're done with the series, you and I collectively as individuals are living a life that is more selfless. And so in our homes, more selflessness. In our marriages, more selflessness. In our church, more selflessness. Uh, in our community, more selflessness. In fact, we're doing something really cool that we've never done ever as a church. March 3rd, March 3rd, we are canceling church services. First time in the history of Expedition Church. We went to the town of Payson and said, okay, we, we not only individually want to live selfless lives, we as a church want to be selfless. What can we do for you? And so they've tasked us with a pro uh, project over on the American Gulch by Sawmill Theater. We're going to do some garbage cleanup. We're going to do some landscaping. They're trying to put in a park over there. There's going to be some painting. We're going to turn it into a big family barbecue. Nine to noon on March 3rd, we're meeting over there. It's going to be a great time doing something as a church 
that is selfless for the community. And so mark your calendars. We're not going to be here. We're going to be over there. And, and the idea is this. What can we do? We don't want to just talk about week in, week out, selfless, and not actually become more selfless. But you know, anybody else feel the tension? I, I, I too often, uh, over the past couple weeks that we've started this series, have come into this, this conflicting moment where, I, where I'm a little bit more aware of my selfishness. Anybody else is that happening to? Okay, I don't necessarily like it, but it's good. And so what we need to do, and it's what we're going to discover this morning, is how do I fundamentally, how do I fundamentally make a shift in my heart and my mind so where that comes more naturally? How does it come more naturally? And that's what we're going to find out from the life of Jesus this morning. Pray with me, if you would, as we begin that. Father, now as we look at your word, uh, we ask that you would uniquely through your spirit instruct us. We believe that you have uh, preserved it for us to understand who you are and your will for our lives, and specifically uh, the life of Jesus and his selflessness. Help us to understand something that fundamentally changes how we navigate life. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So regardless of whether or not you believe Jesus is the Messiah, regardless of whether or not you believe that uh, you should be a follower of Jesus Christ, most people would not deny the fact that Jesus lived a selfless life. Even if you're just merely a historian, you would say, yes, the, the characterization of his life was selflessness. Even his death itself was selfless. And so as I already said, why is that? Why is there this fundamental fundamental uh, uh, outpouring of his life that naturally wasn't bent towards himself. And, and if we, going back to our board that we've been showing you over the last couple of weeks from week one, if we were to say, hey, what was Jesus characterized by? We understand that our default setting is naturally conceit. Anybody remember the, the word, my, my favorite word? Vainglory. Good, man, you guys, I love it when I actually say stuff and people remember it. That's good. <laughs> this glory hunger, starving for glory. And when I want to be significant, this deep down desire to be significant, that naturally leads me to be selfish. And what does that do to relationships? When I want to be significant and I'm selfish, it divides my relationships, it hurts relationships, it isolates me from relationships, and it destroys relationships. And instead, we want to be humble people. This is the example of Christ who was humble and therefore selfless. And when you and I can be selfless, it strengthens relationships and it redeems relationships. It unifies people in relationships, and it builds and strengthens relationship. And so the question this morning that we need to answer is, why was Jesus naturally humble and therefore selfless? What was it about Jesus that made him naturally humble, and then therefore that flowed into this selfless life? And to find that out, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 6. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, with me to Matthew chapter 6. Bible's divided into two major sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The book of Matthew is the first book of the New Testament and essentially tells the story of Jesus' life. But there's a fairly famous, well-known passage of Scripture uh, that people that go to church and a lot of times don't even go to church, they understand. And it's a, a passage where it's a section in the Bible that we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. Some of you may be memorized it in, a, in an older translation, Our Father Who Art in Heaven. Okay, so a lot of us are familiar with it. And, and it's a moment where Jesus says, hey, my people, my people need some instruction on how to best pray. And I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but for the sake of us getting at this, this thing that describes why Jesus was naturally humble and therefore selfless, what are some clues in his prayer that would give us an indicator of why that was? And so in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus says, pray then like this. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed, or that means holy or great, be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, to get the right uh, emphasis for what Jesus is trying to say, or I might say to get the right emphasis uh, for what Jesus... That's humor. Nobody laughed. All right. <laughs> Bom, boom, pff, all right. Crash and burn. To, to, get, to understand what he's trying to get at, you have, to, you have to emphasize the right words in this prayer. Because I could read it, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. 
And it kind of loses the heart of what Jesus is trying to get at, the inference. But if we emphasize the right words, then we say, Jesus is teaching us to pray this way. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And the inference is really, really important for all of us. Because this is the reality. There are two very distinct wills that we can live by. There can be your will, which is the will of the Father, or, anybody know? Anybody have any guesses? My will. My will. Now, anybody, since we're guessing, anybody have any uh, guesses as to when you woke up this morning, whose will was dominating your life? It's our, it's our default. Most of us, as we navigate life, if, we're, if we don't think about it at all, if we're not trying to be thoughtful of it, if we're not trying to be mindful of it, our default setting is my will. My will. It's all about me. It's all about get, getting my needs met, getting what I want, having things go my way, my will. In fact, it, the, the older translations of this passage, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, it says... Thy will be done. So there's this my, thy tension that happens in life. Now understand the the beauty of this. Jesus himself is saying this. It's not all about my will. Think about how, how absurd that is. And hopefully you understand what I mean when I say absurd. That Jesus himself is saying it's not about my will. If anybody should go around you know, life saying, hey, it's all about what I want, it should be Jesus. But Jesus is saying, hey, when I pray, it's not my will be done. It's, it's thy will. It's your will be done. Excuse me. And so the reason that this is so important is because my conceit, my, my need for significance, that vainglory that default setting is because I want to be significant, then I go through life thinking my will be done. My will is for myself. It's what I want. It's what I think I need. What am I going to get out of it? How am I going to benefit from it? And so if we're not mindful of it, if we're not thinking about it, every single one of us navigate every single relationship thinking i got to get out of it what I want to get out of it. I, I, I need things to go my way. Now, you might imagine the problem. You could probably guess on your own, but if I'm always getting my own will and always getting my own way, that often doesn't work out for very healthy relationships. Would you agree with that? And so if you're writing down something in your notebooks, I'd encourage you to write this down. It's the big idea for today. In order for you and I to live a selfless life, you must be willing to, in the word that I chose for the sake of describing this concept, is yield. If you want to live a selfless life, if I want to live a selfless life, then I must, as demonstrated by the prayer of Jesus himself, be willing to yield. What does it mean to yield? It means saying, thy will be done. That's the thing Jesus is trying to help us to understand. It's not about my, what I want. It's, there's a will other than myself. Again, I started this morning saying, what was it about Jesus that seemed to shift his default setting to one of humility and therefore selflessness? It, unlike you and I, his default setting was, wasn't all about getting what he wanted. It was humble. Why was it humble? It's because he went through life. The reason that Jesus was selfless is his default setting is, I'm willing to yield. All throughout the life of Jesus. Listen to these. You might write down the reference and look at them later this week or talk about them in your life groups. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. He says, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. John 4, 34. He says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Isn't that, isn't that wild? Jesus isn't saying like, hey, I'm here to do my work. I'm here to do somebody else's work for me. John 8, 28. 
I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. Luke chapter 22, he's in the garden right before his death. A lot of you are familiar with this passage. He's thinking about the pain, he's thinking about the suffering of the cross, and he's agonizing over it. And so he himself prays in the garden, and he says, Father, if it be your will, then take this cup from me. And the cup is this, is this a, a reference to the pain and the suffering. He'd, he would rather not have to drink from that cup. But then he says, he says Father, if it's your will, then, don't, then I don't want to have to go through the suffering. But, anybody know? Not my will, but yours be done. Thy will be done. What is that? That's Jesus' yielding. The thing, the definitive attitude or mindset that caused Jesus to be humble and therefore selfless is his willingness to yield. It doesn't have to be my way. I don't have to get what I want, how I want it, when I want it. So important to relationships. Let me give you a kind of a trivial example of, of the impact on relationships that maybe helps for illustrative purposes, but uh, in the mornings, my wife and I trade off. My, uh, my son just got his driver's license, and so we, before driver's license, we've been taking him to school in the morning. And I don't know how many of you uh, travel before school around the middle school, high school area in the mornings. Anybody? Anybody? Okay. All right. How fun is that? Woo-hoo-hoo. It is, when, whenever, I, whenever I'm taking uh, Luke to school and dropping him off, it is an exercise in uh, grace and patience and uh, lots of prayer going on because, the, you know, I, I, drive, I drive down this road right here and there's a stop sign, there's a four-way stop right out here. And so there's always this weird thing where, you know how four-way stops are, who got there first, and you get there at the same time, and then you have to figure all that out. And then you go to the next stop sign, and there's a crosswalk, and so kids are going across, and cars are going this way, and parents are dropping off kids where they're not supposed to drop off kids, and kids are pulling out of the parking lot. And then you got to turn onto that road and turn onto another road. There's cars going this way. It's crazy. It's Mad Max pace inversion. It's wild. (laughs) And... And every single time, every single time, there are, there are literally dozens of moments where you get to observe whether or not people yield. Sometimes people do, sometimes they don't. Sometimes I feel like I have the right, and I feel like other people do not. Now, imagine this. Imagine if everybody going to the middle school, high school in the morning, dropping kids off, if nobody yielded to anybody. It would be disastrous. It would be, in, it'd be insanity. Somebody's got to yield to somebody for it to work, for all of that. Kids walking and buses and drop-offs and pickups and moving and stop. Somebody's got to yield. Lots of people have to yield. Nobody yields it's disastrous. It's the same way in our relationships. I don't care if it's in your marriage or in your workplace or in our community. If somebody has to yield for relationships to work, if nobody yields, relationships don't work. They're disasters. Yielding essentially says this, I don't have to get my way. I don't, yielding says, I don't have to get what I want. That's why Philippians chapter 2, going back to the passage that we read already, do nothing, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. What is that? That's yielding. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. What happens when you look to the interests of somebody else? You yield. It doesn't have to go your way. You don't have to get what you want. That's what humility says. Humble people yield. Conceited, proud, selfish people don't yield, and our relationships suffer for it. And that's really why we want to yield. It's because we care about the relationship. If you don't care about the relationship, don't yield. Whatever. But if you care about the relationship, then yield. If you care about 
the place that you work. How many of you have been in a, a meeting at work and you're all sitting around a conference table and lots of ideas are going around and you gotta make a decision on something? And there's one person, there's always one person who says no, because they believe it has to go their, their way. And what does it do to the dynamics of that worker relationship? The whole workplace gets a little funky. How about in a marriage relationship? That's fun when nobody wants to yield. How about in a church? Willingness to yield. Here, the, the, the easiest target to talk about in a church is, uh, and we hear it often, it's the volume of our music. And if we did a survey, which I'm not going to do, <clears throat> you know, we have some people, some people at Expedition who want the music to be louder. <laughs> okay. Withhold your opinion, please. We have, now I can't even say this because now. We also have, <laughs> we also have some people who want it to be quieter. Now, guess what? Everybody can't get what they want. People, so, so if you care about the relationship, which is like a church family, you got to yield. You say, it doesn't have to be my way. I had a guy come up to me after first service, and he said, he said uh, I, I wish it wasn't this loud. Here's how I yield. And he reached in his pocket, and he brings earplugs to church every Sunday. <laughs> how awesome is that, though? He, to be a part of this, that's his yielding. And he could, he could write us notes and say, turn it down, and, but he brings earplugs. What is that? That's a heart, that's a humble that's a humble, selfless heart. In our, in our community, people have to yield. I, I would venture to guess that part of the reason our government isn't as strong or as healthy as it could be is because nobody wants to yield. That's, all, that's as far as I'm going on that one. <laughs> Some of you know I built a house, Shelly and I built a house, and we did it owner-builder, and it took us like a year and a half. We moved in last May, and one of the first things you do when you're building a house is you got to get utilities, gas, water, electricity, and so talk to APS, because you have to talk to APS and say, hey, where does, where does the power come from? Where does the electricity come from? And they said, well, there's a box on your neighbor's yard. It was about 10 feet onto a property. Uh, there's a box, and that's where you tap into the power, dig, dig a trench to your, your panel, and we said, great. And so went over and talked to the neighbor and said, hey, PS said we have to tap into the, the power here, into this box. And uh, so went out the next day, and uh, the fence had been chained and padlocked. <laughs> which, which for me was a sign that she didn't want us to have access to that. And so we had, a, we had a guy from the church, he's actually sitting here this morning, who was gonna dig the trench. And so he, he went out, got his, got his uh, machinery out there, go, went to the back, and, and tried to have a conversation. And it wasn't, the, 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 he, he was nice, but she wasn't very nice. And basically said, there's no way you're coming onto my, my property to do this. So APS had to get involved, it went to the regional level because of, uh, easements and all this other stuff, and long, really unrealistic list of demands that had to be met in order for us to, to do that. It just got crazy, crazy. And so it ended up, we, ended up we, could, we didn't, couldn't get access, and so we had to do something that was, took a lot more time and a lot more money. I, I didn't say last service, but it cost us about $4,000 which for me is a lot of money. And so yesterday, yesterday I'm out working in the yard and a guy who also goes to Expedition, a uh, nice guy, came over and said, hey Donovan, he, he was at my neighbor's house doing some work for her. <laughs> he said, hey Donovan, uh, in order to do the work I need to do, I need to come onto your property. 
And when he, and I said, well, well show me where. <laughs> and the only reason I did, I said that I, I needed to buy some time to process emotions. <laughs> and so we, we, we walked, and, and ironically, it was, it was in the same exact location that we were denied access. And so uh, he showed me, he said, hey, I need to, you know, this is where I need to work. And at this point, she, my, my neighbor had come out and was standing there. <sighs> and so, and so uh, he said, yeah, so I need, to, I need to come on your property. And now, now here's the thing, that the, the relationship with the neighbors stra- strained for sure, as you might imagine. However, however, God says, love everybody, okay? Don't just love lovable people. Love everybody, including difficult neighbors. And so he said, uh, I need access. And she's standing there said, and I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be nice and I'll let you have access to my property. And she said, every other conversation has been fairly colorful, if you know what I mean. Uh, certain words I can't say in church and certain hand gestures that I can't show in church. <laughs> and, so, and so we've been, my wife and I have been praying and praying and praying for this relationship when we've tried to, tried to be kind and loving. And so I said, yeah, you can have access to my property. And, and, she, and she, for the first time, said something nice. She said, thank you, Donovan. And I said, you're welcome. And it, was, it, felt, it felt like a shift in the relationship. And the only, the only difference is I could be conceited and selfish and the relationship could continue to be divided and she could continue to be isolated or I can try to somehow be humble and therefore selfless. But you know what? And I don't know where it's gonna go because it just was yesterday but I can hope that maybe there will be some sort of redemption that comes as a result. And it's all about this, this place where, man, in the tent, the, it was, you know, lights, the light side, the dark side, all of those in me all at once and trying to figure out what do I give into. That was a Star Wars reference. Okay. <laughs> But my way, does it have, do I have to get what I want because of my pride? Or can I be like Jesus somehow and say, it's not about, I, yield, just yield. You don't have to get what you want. It doesn't have to go your way. Let me give you an illustration maybe that will help you with a picture. Levi, can you help me? Yeah? Can you come up here, please? I need somebody else. That uh, hi Levi, Hello. how are you? Is Travis in here, or was that last service? No, oh, where where are you, Travis? Oh, he's not here. Okay, okay. is he here, Travis? Come on, Travis. I'm, I can't. I don't see him. Point him out. Travis, come on up. You are hiding, man. That was good. Come on up. <laughs> You couldn't have gotten any more underneath that pew. <laughs> it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. The reason I chose Travis and Levi is because he does all the mechanic work for his equipment. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I have a $20 gift certificate, certificate to Common Grounds, okay? This is for you, but you can't have it yet. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it right over here for you, okay, Levi? Your family would love it if you took them there and bought them, bought them a nice coffee drink, right? Yeah, daughter's saying yes. Okay, th- this is for you, okay? But I'm gonna put it right over here, okay? Levi, it's not yours, it's Travis's. Travis, not yours. Okay, so here's, here's the instructions. We have, we have two steps here. One step, two step, okay? I need you both to, to stand on the first step. Okay, you are not allowed, your job, your job is to go get that gift certificate. 
Your job is to go get that gift certificate. You cannot leave this step. Okay? You also, you also cannot touch each other. Okay? Ready? Go. You didn't do anything wrong, no. I mean, you, you failed at the purpose, but nothing wrong. That was pretty good. Okay, you, you're not helping me with my illustration, though. Go back, o- go back over there, okay? All right, start over again. This time, don't be so... Uh, Acrobatic. Okay, so last service it worked really good, but I had no idea Levi would be so uh, talented. So the the what's that? Do I get his card? You can go get you. one more time. I, I'm trying to think of what to do that you ruined my illustration. I th- I think we can redeem this somehow. I don't know if you noticed, I don't know if you noticed this, but Travis had a part to play in his success. Did you notice that? What did he do? He yielded. Now, here's one thing that you could have done. This is what they did last service, all right? Both of you walk over there. All right. <laughs> okay, you can sit, you can sit down. <laughs> but what you, what you did was way better. <laughs> That's good. Oh man, yeah. Thank thank you guys for that. Yeah. So so here's the thing. Worst case scenario is they, they both just look at each other and stand their ground and nobody yields and then guess what happens? Nope, nobody wins, nothing gets done, neither of them ultimately get what they want. Now, another thing that could have happened is Levi could have simply gone, okay, I, I give up and you go ahead and I, I'm going to lose out. I'm going to lose out, but for the sake of you getting what you want, I'll do that. Or there's this beautiful relationship where if you can figure it out, how do we both yield and both get what we want? But it only comes in yielding. Here's what I know to be true. Yielding in relationships, if we can, if we can navigate life and say, it, it, I don't have to get what I want, It doesn't have to go my way. Oftentimes, different options open up that end up being really healthy and really powerful and really beautiful in our relationships, whatever environment that is. But the key is, how do we have the selfless mind of Christ that is humble and it says, it doesn't have to go my way. I don't have to get what I want. We're going to close with a song, but before we do, I'm going to ask that you would pray. Stand up with me, please. And we're going we're gonna to sing a song that we've sang uh, often, but, but I want us to sing it a little bit differently this morning, specifically in the form of a prayer. The words uh, have to do with this, this mindset that Jesus had of saying, it doesn't have to be my way. It doesn't have to be about getting what I want. But before we sing it, I'm going to ask that you would pray with me. Maybe you would just go into a, an attitude of prayer, and I would ask that Uh, Holy Spirit, in this moment, would you reveal a specific relationship for each and every person that's here today that perhaps is strained because of a lack of yielding? Reveal in this moment 
some sort of, uh, maybe it's in a friendship or a family relationship, a marriage, a work relationship, a relationship in the community. And it's, it's just not a picture that you want for us, but it's because somewhere in there, there's a, a lack of willingness to yield. And now I'm going to ask that you would do something profound in the lives of everybody here. And, and that is that uh, the example of your son Jesus would somehow inspire us and motivate us to be humble like he was and trust you for the results. Trust to see how you can bring about something good and beautiful and redemptive in that relationship. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.